This is the Detroit Sports Podcast Network. Today's episode of Doc and Jock is brought to you by Score, a new mobile app coming soon. Score is an interactive game that lets users win deals at bars and restaurants based on what's going on in live sporting events. Find new places to watch games and save money on your bill at the same time by taking advantage of Score's unique interactive specials that give you an additional stake in the action. A Score special can be anything a location wants to be, from 10% off an item if a team scores a touchdown to a free round of drinks if a quarterback throws for 400 yards. Any stat can be turned into a game. Pick the deals you want to win, watch the games you want to watch, and score deals in real time. The app will update when your team or player records a relevant stat. When the conditions of your deal are met, the coupons are sent to your device to show your server or bartender. It's that easy. Score is coming to the App Store and Google Play soon. For more information, check them out on the web at score-app.io and follow them on Twitter and Instagram at Score Deals. Score, watch games, score deals. Is there is there a sports podcast in Detroit that people are talking about? Hey everybody, this is Freddie Cohen of ESPN Radio. When I'm not talking about breaking news or breaking news on ESPN Radio, I'm always a fan and listen to the Detroit Sports Podcast, and so should you. Coming to you live from Sterling Heights, the Doc and Jock Podcast Studios. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for tuning in. I'm the Doc, John Macaroon. Joining me, my cousin, Adam, the Jock Strozinski. What's up, cuz? Fresh off that defeat to you in fantasy football. Congratulations, sir. No Dude. matter what, you'll be playing for some money. Whether you win it or not, totally up in the air. It was a fascinating way of watching football because... It was a you dumpster know, fire. <laughs> it was great because of the fact that, look, um, the Sunday night game, Pittsburgh Steelers versus the Baltimore Ravens had everything to do with you and I's matchup. You needed about six or seven points from Martavis Bryant. So I went up to the bar, just me and maybe five patrons, throwing them down, having a good time. So I went to a, a buddy's bar and watched a really good football game. So I got some secondary gain watching an offensive game. I thought it was going to be lower scoring, but... The Steelers and the Ravens balled out. They were throwing the ball over the place. So when Ben Roethlisberger drops back and throws over 60 times, I thought, well, Martavis Bryant's going to get some cheap yards. But going into the fourth quarter, all he needed was seven yards. One catch, anything, you know. He could have gotten anything and you would have tied. But nothing Dude, he happened. Was targeted in the end zone like two yeah. or three times too. And each time and I was screaming, I go, oh. it was great. So, oh, so frustrating. In an epic battle, I won 83 to 82. Epic. But in the end, both tight ends scored no points. In the end, you got to take the brunt of the blame because you left the most points on the bench. I did. So, what went into your decision to not play Case Keenum fantasy football playoffs? It's Case Keenum. I had his Kirk, numbers were good. I no? had Kirk Cousins, and Kirk Cousins is that was your guy. He's basically been a top five starter all year long. So, uh, I generally go with the theory: you play your studs. Kirk Cousins has been a stud. I know Case Keenum has just been out of this world lately, but look, the one time I start Case Keenum, watch me, watch him put up 10 points. You know what I'm saying? In this instance, uh, Kirk Cousins gave me the 11 ball, so I ended up, you know, tanking, but that's what I get for trusting a Spartan quarterback. You know, it's my own fault. I mean, plenty of good Michigan quarterbacks. Oh, wait, no, no, there's not. There's Tom Brady and Tom Brady. Well, I mean, I guess, hey, Tom Brady, right? You can't do much better than that, can you? Man, let me tell you something. I'm sitting here very comfortable, okay? I went out and I started the Christmas shopping cuz, but inevitably what ends up happening is, and I love it about me each and every year, I set out to finally break the curse of going on the 23rd or 24th of December. And I say to myself, okay, I'm going to get early. Hold on, hold on. And for those who don't know, you're the kind of guy who will wait till like the 24th, right? Exactly. We've got Christmas Eve. We got Christmas Eve dinner usually going on at your wife's mother's house, so your mother-in-law's house. We usually have that going on. Everybody's got to be there around, I don't know, four, five, or six. I The time always changes. But everybody has to be there at about that time. You're the kind of guy to go out on the 24th at like 345, and, and everything's closed, so you got to stop at a gas station to get a gift card. So I tried. Which is awesome. <laughs> yes. I find it amazing <laughs> that you're able to pull it off every single year. So I tried this year to go out, but inevitably what ends up happening and why this happens is I just go out and buy shit for myself. <laughs> and I'm sitting here rocking a very comfortable Michigan State I, I noticed you were wearing that. I feel good. good. I feel great broadcasting in it all week. I feel comfortable. It's a nice scarf, and I'm a scarf guy. Being a soccer fan, I've now got a collection. I got a Wings one. I got a Liverpool one. And now I'm rocking you have a, a Detroit FC one? 
Uh, I do not. You I have not, not been out there yet. I've got to get out there. I know um, a lot of people talk about it, and it's a great time, and I hear it from afar, but I'm going to get out there soon. Maybe pick up a Detroit FC scarf. Maybe hopefully one day pick up a Detroit MLS scarf. But you, I like these you scarves. Know, I feel of the good. Podcast, uh, uh, Neil Rule, he plays a major part in all of that. You know, maybe I should try and, and get a free one. And it's right down the street from my house. Yeah, like, maybe you're I connected, should, and you don't even realize. We should ask for a free one, see if he'll drop <laughs> off. Maybe just a quick promotion, a little trade-off, quick promotion for his broadcast. Just give us a little uh, Detroit FC. Maybe we'll just hang it up here. Give us some on, swag. Yeah, we'll just hang it up here in the office. But I, I just I hate I hate to be selfish, but I had to buy it. It's so comfortable. I it's feel nice, good, man. So how did you take in Sunday's game? Did you did you sit there and did you invest yourself heavily like normal and watch the entire thing? Man, it was a situation where I was like, okay, I'm gonna get off of work at like twelve o'clock. I kind of was passively watching it because of the fact that I kind of knew what was going to happen. I felt like the way the game played out was what was going to go down. The lines were going to keep it close. It was going to be a situation where, you know, even if they got out to a lead, that they would do something to let Tampa Bay back in it. So it played out the way I thought it would. I'm just happy they won. I know a lot of people are pissed off and exploring how they played. They're looking at, you know, a lot of deeper factors. I'm happy they walked away with the victory. But what made it worse was when you actually watch a real game, sitting down at a bar, you're sitting there, you know, just kind of taking it all in, a quiet environment. You're looking around, having a beer, and you're watching the Steelers and Ravens just throw the ball. You hang out at just a you know a bar on Sunday night on a cold day. It's not too busy. You know what I mean? But at the same time, you're watching. You're the life of the party, bro. That's right. I was the life of the party. I had a good time because well, I was the only one cheering for you know the, some some outcome because I don't think there are too many yeah. people there. For well, who the hell's really invested in a Pittsburgh right. Ravens game? But you're sitting there watching. And you say to yourself, oh, my God, Ben's throwing the ball to an open Antonio Brown. You got this Collins dude running all, all over the place effectively for the Ravens. You got passion. You got the coach of the Steelers ripping on his defense going, what the hell are you guys doing? And you watch that game and you go, wow, I've missed entertaining football. And I know why people that say I don't want to watch NFL football anymore or, or I don't want to watch the Lions. You don't get too many games like that. And watching the Lions, it's hard because if you're not a fan – of Detroit, and you sit and you actually just remove yourself from being a fan, the Lions don't play entertaining football. We've said that now for the better part of a year. It's a grind, and it's hard as a fan because you want them to win. And uh, better part I, of like four years, dude. You know, they go with the age-old adage, if it ain't rough, it ain't right. But it's it's taxing. It's really hard. And there were so many mistakes. I mean, both sides were turning the ball over at a high clip. Matthew Stafford was a little bit disappointing in some of the mistakes that he made. So you look at the quality of it, you grade it poorly, but I watched it passively. I'm a fan. We'll always watch it for the podcast and to you know watch NFL football. But when you juxtapose that with a real game that I watched, it's it's tough and it's almost crazy to sit there and watch a Lions game based on how they play. Yeah, look, man, I, I figured it out. I'm going to be honest with you. I didn't watch the game live. Yeah. I, I sat there. I DVR'd it. And you know what? I said, screw it. I'm going to go Christmas shopping. So I came home and we had to build something for, for my niece for Christmas we had to like put it together and assemble it so my dad didn't have to do it. it. It was the best way to watch the game because I was half invested in watching the game. I already knew the outcome. So I was half invested, just kind of keeping my eyes on big plays and, and things to talk about. But it didn't. I didn't sit there and, and build my day around it. Normally when the Lions play, I build my entire Sunday around that game, no matter what's going on. Like I'm not leaving the couch. Even if it's a blizzard and I got to get out there and I got to shovel snow, I'm not getting off the couch to go push snow. I'm not, I'm not doing anything, right? The wife can be like, hey, can you come do this? No, no, I can't. I can't do anything for you right now. I'm invested. And you know what? I said, screw it. This team obviously doesn't care, so why the hell should I? And you know what? They went out there, they won a game that they probably should have lost. It, 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 it was totally enjoyable for me to watch it, not to be as invested emotionally in it, not to sit there and waste my entire day doing it. And you know what I find amazing? You sat there and you brought up uh, Baltimore's running back, how they have a running back who can just run all over the place. Do you realize that their running back, Alex Collins, is like their fifth string running back? Yeah. Terrence West was their first string. He gone. Uh, Danny Woodhead's been injured most of the year. Jarvis Allen's been there. Then there's Buck Allen, right? Dude. Alex Collins is their fifth string running back, and, and he's just putting up yards. This guy's played a part of a season, and he almost has 900 yards already. We've got two running backs here who can't do a damn thing. I was confused, too, before the game. Now, we'll talk about Amir Abdullah and his benching, whether it was due to health or whether it was due to performance. But did you find it odd that the Lions would release you know, to the national media that Caldwell's extension was only for one year beyond this year. Oh, I loved it. I thought it was cool, but at the same time, you know, it does ease the tension in that if there's a total collapse, 
and uh, a returning quarterback who we will talk about has been cleared to return and is likely to show up at Ford Field. In what the did final. I tell you? What did I tell you? To we'll start talk the about year? that. What we'll talk you? about that. But Jim Caldwell, I'm surprised. Was it a message to kind of slow down the fans? I mean, the national media was joking around all week long. The local media, us, everybody was talking about nine men on the field. All of a sudden, a report shows up that, hey, hey, relax, don't worry, that Jim Caldwell is only on the hook for one more year, and if we decide to let him go, we don't have to pay him that much. I felt like if you're an organization and you want to send a message to your coach, is that what you're trying to do? I feel like— I think it was a stroke of genius by Bob Quinn. You think so? I think so. Think about it. Look at it this way, right? So you're the laughing stock of all of the NFL, all of the NFL media. Everybody's joking about you. I think it was Fox's uh, Sunday broadcast sat there and they did a parody about it. We got a ton of views off of that. With, with, with a yeah. coach who, who's doing, who only has <laughs> nine guys on the <laughs> that field. That was funny. It, it, you know what I'm saying? So you, you are obviously the laughing stock uh, of the NFL at this point. It's a masterstroke by, by Bob Quinn, basically telling Jim Caldwell, get your shit together. If you can't get your stuff together, you're going to be gone. Like, you got to realize too, Jim Caldwell's not Bob Quinn's guy. Jim Caldwell is Martha Ford's guy. At this point, I don't know if Bob Quinn has the the authority or, I don't know, the chutzpah, if you would say, to to be able to to go in there and, and kick Jim Caldwell out. I would hope so. I really would. Otherwise, why does he have this job? Why did he take this position? He shouldn't be here if that's the case. I think it was a masterstroke because now you put all the onus on Jim Caldwell. You say, hey, just so you know, you could be gone, and I don't care. You're not my guy. Get us to the playoffs, and if you don't, you're out of here. And but at the same what, time, what it, is. it seems backhanded and, 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 and so typical of the Lions because if you sit around the room, Bob Quinn and the staff and Jim Caldwell should say, he doesn't have the horses. The offensive line is underperforming. You bring in TJ Lang and Rick Wagner. They're underperforming, making a lot of mistakes. The entire offensive line, I think, got a holding call in this game. Uh, you don't have a solid running back. You got some holes on the team. So how can Jim Caldwell now sit there and look at the Lions organization and say, do you guys got my back? What the heck? You didn't you didn't saddle me with extreme talent where one guy goes out on the defense, Haloti Nada, and the entire defense falls apart. You can't stop the run. So at the same time, if I'm Jim Caldwell, I'm putting it right back up there, maybe not so assertively and out there, but maybe say, look, some of our horses are down and we don't got enough maybe to actually get there because I feel like Jim Caldwell, needs, if that is the case, should stand up for himself and say, listen, you know, I'm the I'm a winning coach here. I'm somebody that's gotten this team to the postseason with a couple more pieces. I think we can make the next step. So I feel like for the Lions to do that is a little bit backhanded. And why would you do that to placate the fans? I mean, yeah, they're going to laugh at you. They're going to laugh at the nine men. But you had a game versus Tampa that – you know, unlike what you said, I feel like going into it, you had a more than 80% chance of winning because Tampa's garbage. So to do it that way, I feel like... You it, just barely beat a garbage team. Exactly. But I feel like doing it that way maybe even rubs Jim Caldwell the wrong way. Look at it this way, right? If you're Jim Caldwell, you can do that. But go around the NFL and tell me which team has a perfect team. You know what I'm saying? Tell me which team team is, is built so incredibly well that they have no faults, no flaws, no no issues whatsoever. Look at the Philadelphia Eagles. They just lost their starting quarterback. They've got some issues there. Look at the Pittsburgh Steelers. That defense, obviously it can be got. I mean, Baltimore just came in and, what, put up 38 on them? You know, look look at Minnesota. Minnesota has a a second and a third string running back. They're on their second and third string quarterback. I mean, they're built around a defense that's pretty decent, but that offense still has some issues. Look at the New England Patriots. Their defense has been abysmal most of the year. And if you can't, if their if their wide receivers can't get open, they've already proven that the Miami Dolphins can beat them. The Miami Dolphins, Jay Cutler under center, the Miami Dolphins can beat the New England Patriots. Do you know what I'm saying? Look, every team has issues. Every team has has problems. I think with Jim Caldwell, the big issue is he can't get personnel groupings out there. It's the same mistakes over and over. Yes. He's been doing this now for four years. Get it corrected. I, I mean. Jesus Christ, man. It was bad enough when you were putting 10 guys out there. Now you're putting nine out there? <laughs> that was like, funny. Like, your team's not good enough to win with nine guys. Your team's not good enough to win with 11 guys. What are you doing? You know? And you look at the defense. I mean, Haloti Nada went down in week five, man. Week five. We're now into what? Week 14? And you still haven't been able to figure out how to fix your defense nine weeks later, and you still don't know how to how to correctly adjust your defense. And that goes on the coaching, whether it be Terrell Austin or whether it be Jim Caldwell. Terrell Austin's a Jim Caldwell guy, so he's got to. He, it has to lie at his feet. Okay, so you don't have an issue. I I 
I think it's debatable because at the same time, I feel like if you want to make maybe uh, send that message, maybe you do it uh, earlier in the year when you when, when some of these things were starting Look, to evolve. I think you can make the case that this team over the course of the last four years has won games in spite of Jim Caldwell, not because of Jim Caldwell. If Jim Caldwell is a really good coach, how many wins would he help this team get? One, maybe two a year, right? I think this team has won in spite of him because I think he has put them behind the eight ball time and time and time again. And you said it when, when he was first hired. He's a stopgap stop gap coach. That's stop what he gap. is. You, you, you obviously have your franchise quarterback. You just paid him a ton of money. You've got a line that is much improved over the last couple years. At least on paper it looks that way. I know this year it really hasn't played out that well. You've got pieces on that defense. You've got a really good secondary here. A very good secondary. And you've got a a, a rookie. opportunistic defense that can get turnovers. It does. You do. You have a you have a rookie uh, a linebacker who looks like he may be good. He's struggling a little bit right now, but he's a rookie again. You've got pieces on this team. You have guys. Yet this coach can't sit there and get you to go forward. I mean, if you're going to tell me that when Jim Caldwell took over this team four years ago, it was a much more talent rich and talent laden team than what he has now, I'm going to call you an idiot, and I'm going to say there's no way in hell. Do you know what I'm saying? There's been some regression here with the coach and not so much the team. So I blame this all on Jim Caldwell. I don't think he's a good coach. I mean, yeah, Bob Quinn needs to do more. There has to be better moves that are made, and there are giant holes on this team that have to be filled, but that's going to happen. It's going to come through the draft, and it's going to come through free agency. It's going to happen. Jim Caldwell's got to go. He's not a good coach. Yeah, you won a game against a garbage, absolutely atrocious team in Tampa Bay. You, You beat them by a field goal. That happened in the final seconds of the game. Come on, man. That's a team that you should have went out there and you should have destroyed. You should have beat them. And I don't put this game on Matt Stafford. I don't blame it on Stafford at all. I don't think it's his fault. Yeah, he's playing with a little bit of a banged up hand. And yeah, he threw two awful picks. Two horrible picks. But this all goes to that coaching staff. Whether it be Terrell Austin. Whether it be Jim Bob Cooter. Whether it be the man himself, Jim Caldwell. In the end, it all lies at his feet because these are his hires. These are his guys. So earlier in the week, the media asked offensive coordinator Jim Bob Cooter if he still thought that Amir Abdullah was his best running back, declined to comment. You had a situation where in the game versus Tampa Bay, he's not playing. It comes out, he's saying that, look, I I was healthy enough to play. Jim Caldwell says, no, it's medically related. So you look at the entire picture, Theo Riddick was able to do some things. He was effective, and they threw the ball more. They recognized, look, we can't run the ball. We just can't do it effectively at a clip that's even close to professional. So why not utilize our strength, which is Matthew Stafford, and Amir Abdullah sat on the bench, whether you want to call it an injury, whether you want to call it him being benched, Dude, quote unquote, benched. Doesn't matter. I agree with the decision. Yep. I feel like hundred percent. He, the team is better without Amir Abdullah. I feel like the organization finally recognized it. Ten games too late. They realized this guy can't hit the holes. He can't do the job. Can't he, hold on to the ball. The lines are better without him. Yes. And so many people texted us and tweeted us and said, "Look, why don't you just utilize him second down? A couple situations where you can use him. Fine. But I see a scenario in which he needs to be off the team." And Amir Abdullah cannot do the job, and you got to roll with Theo Riddick. Now, what people are saying is— Trade him. Get a draft pick. Try to do something. Yeah, trade him. Let him go. Um, and look, move on. Move on. I, I totally understand, right? He's a, he was he's a second-round draft pick. And move th- th- on. That's a lot to invest in a guy and just turn around and say, you know what? We're done. I get it. But you know what you can do? You get trade him for a fifth-round draft pick. Then you know what you do? You take a couple fifths, and you take another draft pick, and you pair all that stuff up, and it allows you to move up, and it allows you to go out there and get a running back. Yep. A guy like a Kareem Hunt. Uh, a guy like a, uh, a guy like Kamara. You know, it allows you to move up in the draft and go get the guys that you want to get. Look, Amir Abdullah has been awful since day one. I don't trust him with the football. He's got baby hands. He drops the ball all the time. If you spill the pill, you can't play. And that's what he does. Look, Theo Riddick got put in that game. He performed. Teon Green is probably your best running back on this team right now who can run between the tackles and, and can sit there and carry a guy or two. Do you know what I'm saying? Utilize these two guys as a combo. You don't have much of a season left. You're playing for everything you got. A, a guy a guy in, in Green Bay is coming back who's going to kill you. So, look, you got to win games because the only way you're getting in the playoffs is if you get some help. So you got to roll your best guys forward, and that's going to be Theo Riddick, and that's going to be Teon Green. Amir Abdullah shouldn't be on this team right now. 
Exactly. Totally agree. So with that said, you were talking about the draft. Do you think then the focus of the next draft should be the running back or maybe look at addressing some other weaknesses, maybe along the lines of the defensive line or a defensive end, or maybe continue to address that uh, that defense where you can maybe uh, add some more depth through the draft? What are you thinking about maybe improving this team going forward? All right. So right now, the Lions are, are drafting 17th. So I haven't really sat down and looked at any mock drafts or or really studied what's going on and who's coming out and who who's going to be available. But at that pick, if they were to stay, if everything was to hold and, and just be static and they're going to draft at 17, I'm probably going to go with a, a defensive end at that point because I'm not sure what kind of value you're going to get for a, a running back there, you know? I mean, if you look at last year's draft, it was so rich with running backs. Last year was the, was was the draft to go get a running back. I mean, you could have took Marlon Mack in, what, the sixth round? I mean, come on. And, and look, some of you guys might be saying, who the hell's Marlon Mack? He's the running back for Indy, and Indy's an absolutely garbage team, and Marlon Mack shows a little bit of a spark and shows that he can do some things now and again. All right? He's not getting all the pub and all the press like a Kareem Hunt or an Alvin Kamara, but he can do some stuff. He can do some things. It, it just, at that point, you, you got to address the defense. The defense is abysmal. I mean... You don't have a running game, but yet everybody else's team looks really healthy when they run it on you. So you got to address that defensive line some way, somehow. I, I don't know if you got to go get a, a defensive tackle that's going to help it out, or you got to go get an edge rusher and maybe move away from Ziggy Ansah. That's something else we're going to have to discuss. Moving away from Ziggy Ansah, where has he been all year? And I get it. Look, last year he was really hurt and banged up, and this year supposedly he's hurt and he's banged up. But, geez, man, you can't stay healthy. And the best availability is availability, and you're not ever available, and you can't perform the way you could. You know, you remember when Ziggy Ansah was like two years ago, three years ago? I mean, the guy was unstoppable. He was a freak of nature. And everybody was like, oh, it's because he was playing next to Sue, he was this, that, the other thing. Sue left. He was still able to get sacks and still able to rough up the passer. I haven't seen it in years, man. So my thoughts on your question involve, again, doubling down on a mistake. I feel like TJ Lang has been an epic bust. Okay. Uh, he making too many mistakes. Rick Wagner, there's a reason why Baltimore let him go, and I don't think it's money related because offensive linemen are coveted, even if you have to overspend. And so when Baltimore let him go, we all felt like he could come in and do the job. He's been up and down, hasn't been the guy that we thought that we were getting. TJ Lang makes a lot of mistakes. He's injury prone, and you're looking at a situation where that offensive line has to be continued to be evolved and looked at. And you maybe have to look at the coaching too because others have left and have done some things. So what's going on along that offensive line? So I feel like you double down, improve the offensive line, and you upgrade at the running back position. But I think the running back position doesn't involve Amir Abdullah 100%. you got to move on from him, let him go. So now we sit here as Lions fans, and we're right back in the tough spot, right smack dab in the middle of, do we root for this team to win? Some people are actually debating whether the victory versus Tampa Bay was a terrible thing because it hurts your draft stock. What purpose does it really do? Because when they survey the landscape, the Lions are basically only have like a 15% chance of making the postseason. Now you couple that with Aaron Rodgers returning. So we're left here as fans going, how the hell do we think about this? Do we want to win the last three games and, and go 10 and 6 and then just miss out and then have Jim Caldwell come back? We can clap and say, well, look, he had a 10 win season, just some bad luck. They can pinpoint the Atlanta game that screwed him. Or do we say, look, just end this nonsense, go out there Saturday, lose to Chicago, so we don't have to talk about this, and maybe we can even start the process of a rebuild if the loss is so atrocious with a lot of mistakes, maybe Jim Caldwell can even be let go sooner prior to the end of the season. I don't even know how to think about it because I feel like how it's going to play out is the Lions are going to win the next two games, and then they're going to play Green Bay, and Aaron Rodgers is going to show out, and we're going to lose that way, like many people have said. Or another scenario is I don't see a scenario in which the Lions win out. There's going to be a craptastic performance in there, maybe on the road versus Cincy. might be a horrible weather game. It might be a situation where that contest is a snow game where you got to count on your running backs, and they might go you know, 20 carries for 15 yards. So it's tough to think about where we want this team to go. Do they Should they lose out? Should they epically tank? I always root for them to win. I, I have a hard time watching them and saying, I hope they lose, but I can objectively sit here and say, I wouldn't be as hurt. I guess I can say it. I wouldn't be as angry if they lost and it all kind of went to shit because I'm ready for the next phase. I'm ready for the next head coach to come in. But if the scenario plays out, I would rather the loss come to either Chicago or Cincy than to get everybody's hopes up. Home game, last game of the season, two or three years straight of the same stuff. Aaron Rodgers versus Stafford and the edge goes to Aaron Rodgers again. I'd be kind of disappointed and devastated with that scenario. 
I got you. Let's look at how this team would have to get into the playoffs. That's a miracle. It's it's going to take a whole lot of help. Okay, so Atlanta and Seattle both are basically a game and a half above you. Remember, you lost to Atlanta, and and then Seattle's eight and five right now. So you almost have to win two games, and you've got to count on them to at least two uh, lose two of their next three games. I don't see this happening. I don't know a world where this is going to happen. So a lot of help is needed, and it involves a lot of losses from these some good teams. Exactly. On top of that, now you've got a, a, an Aaron Rodgers who's been cleared to play. Yay. He's going to come to Detroit. And, and you mean, flashbacks of the Hail Mary game. Do you know what I'm saying? It, it, I just... I see this it's just like an old wound that you just keep ripping the scab off of. This is what's going to happen. It, this is what I predicted when we sat there and we previewed this season. Aaron Rodgers, your season is going to be on the line. Aaron Rodgers is going to come in, and he's going to jail sex you. He's going to house you. He's going to use absolutely no lube, and it's going to be as thick as a two-liter pop bottle, and it's going to go in your backside. 80% of our followers at Detroit Podcast voted, and they have more confidence in a returning Aaron Rodgers than their own starting quarterback. Well, yeah, I would too. It's 80% just, is pretty history. strong. Look at the history. Time and time again. It happens all the time. Look, I want, what do you prefer? I want this team to lose out. Just lose. No. Just be done with this. I mean, it would have been better if you would have lost last week because at least then you could have guaranteed yourself a top 10 pick. You know, oh, no. you lose out. Yeah, Dan, you Team lose tank. out. Team tank. For real. You lose out the rest of the season. You're, you're, you're setting yourself up and you're putting yourself in a position where you can then have a top 10 pick. And there, look, when we, when we look at the draft, there is usually much more talent in the top 10 than there is in the top 15, the top 20, or even, even the whole first round. As you go back in the draft, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out. It gets a little bit sparse. If I'm the Lions... Lose out, guarantee yourself a spot in the top Lose 15, out. <laughs> and go get some help. Whether, like you said, you know that offensive line does not look good, so you might have to address that. That defensive line sure as hell doesn't look good, so you might need to address that. We haven't had a running back in how long? I mean, when Reggie Bush is mocking you on Twitter weeks ago, there's an issue. Reggie Bush, really? He was your last 100-yard rusher. I mean, that guy can't even play anymore, and he's mocking you on Twitter. So a running back might help. I'm just saying. And, of course, your linebacking core is always weak. You always need depth on this team. So there are positions that you need to address on this team, and you got to start addressing them. Look, if you invest your first-round pick in a running back, I'm not going to shoot you. I'm not going to go crazy. I'm not going to lose my mind because you need a running back. If you're going to invest a first-round pick in a defensive lineman, I'm not going to go crazy. I'm not going to shoot you. If you invest in an offensive lineman, I'm cool with that too because, obviously, the offensive line has not been good. I mean, you sat there and you just went through it, and you you basically cut up the two free agent signings that they had, and look, you you lost your starting left tackle. That was a little bit of an issue. Your, Your center's been in and out. You know, Graham Glasgow's got to play nine different roles on that offensive line, so... Thank God he's a smart guy. Good old Michigan boy right there. You know, unlike your Michigan State quarterbacks who sit there and bone me in fantasy football. I should have knew the fix was in. <laughs> anyway, Yes. That's what makes it so much more fun, too. It's like, oh, yeah, Kirk Cousins. How cute. Why would he trust a Spartan to uh, be on his team? How, oh, how, cute? So bad. how cute. Anyways, you've got too many holes. You, you, you need stuff fixed up, down, left, right, and center. So help your team out by losing so you can ensure a better draft pick. This Saturday, I see a victory. I feel like um, the Lions are, they know, they recognize that this is a postseason for them. They got to win. They're going to play at home. Saturday, I know it's one day less of preparation. I feel like the 430 start will benefit them. They will play very well. It'll be a very close game, like always. And I do feel like Matthew Stafford showing no signs of an injury with his hand. He can do the job. And I do believe that the emergence of Marvin Jones and Eric Ebron and Golden Tate, once they figure out how to utilize the offense and the wide receivers properly, along with the tight ends you don't have to have a solid running game they kind of recognizing what they are and they just got to get those extra three or four yards by utilizing screen games you know out in the flat short passes and then take your chances deep so as long as you got Matthew Stafford you have a chance you're in the conversation so I feel like the Lions Saturday I don't see a scenario in which they lose unless they start playing like Tampa Bay and turning the ball over making stupid mistakes they walk away with a seven point victory let's look at what Chicago does well They run the ball extremely well. They got to do that a lot. What does Detroit do extremely poorly on defense? They stop the run. So I think this game is going to come down to the run game. Also, you got to look at what what would help Detroit the most. Not now, but in the future. If Detroit was to lose this game, 
it would help them the most, right? Yeah. So chances are they're probably going to win this game to sit there and bone themselves. Right. But it's all going to come down to Chicago's run game and Detroit's run defense. That's where it's going to be at. Matt Stafford's going to put some points up. He's going to throw the ball all over the yard. He's going to put points up. It's going to be fine. Can Detroit's defense stop that running game? And look, it's not just Jordan Howard. It's Tariq Cohen, too. They've got a speedster, and they got a guy who can sit there and grind you into dust with Jordan Howard. So they got a two-headed attack. On top of it, Mitch Trubisky is looking much more comfortable out, huh? underneath yeah. center. So that's a team that's coming alive and playing really well. If they lose the game, I'll be excited and I'll be happy. That being said, I don't think it's going to happen. I think in the end... Detroit ends up winning this game probably by a field goal. Real quick, NFL story. You kind of peeking in at uh, Garoppolo over there in San Francisco? Oh, my God. Does he not look good or what? Oh, my gosh. I'm like, did offense look plausible? I'm like, man, I just don't want to <laughs> see. What a difference a quarterback makes, I just right? don't want to see a couple quarterbacks get their first playoff win ahead of Stafford Goff. I don't want to see Trubisky. I don't want to see Jimmy Garoppolo go out there and show out because you could have had these guys if you had some gumption and maybe took a chance. So the Lions hitched their wagon to Matthew Stafford, and there are younger guys doing some things with maybe a little bit less. Just saying, we shall see if some of of these younger quarterbacks bypass Matthew Stafford because he's still got national respect. He's still a guy that people look to and are very favorable of. But again, those mistakes versus Tampa, you can make them versus the crumb bum teams. You went out and did it. But you do that versus the Saints, you do that versus the team like Seattle or now the new L.A. Rams, you're going to put your team in a massive hole and you're not going to come back from it. So I just want to see, and I hate to say it, but I want to see Garoppolo fail. Fall flat on his face so that we can validate our guy. (laughs) Let me ask you this. It's probably way too early, and it absolutely is way too early, but I want you to put it in stone. Do you believe that Goff or Carson Wentz or even Garoppolo – are going to be an elite quarterback or at least be in that top five. Like right now, we, we sit there and we, we talk about Tom Brady being the best of all time. Talk about Aaron Rodgers being up there. Talk about uh, Drew Brees. Uh, sometimes Ben Roethlisberger's mentioned in, in that whole. Here's what they got better. Guys. Stafford's Do you think more, those three guys. Are Stafford's be there? more talented. They got better coaches. So that puts them in a better position. Stafford's more talented, better arm strength, a better quarterback overall with, their, with his talent. But when you got a scheme that neuters you and you don't have oh, a significant piece, I mean, Todd Gurley's better than anything you got. Other teams have more weapons, and I think they got better coaches. Kyle Shanahan's played in big games. Kyle Shanahan over there in San Francisco has coached in big games, has made some mistakes that he can learn from. Jim Caldwell as well, but I feel like the trajectory of these other guys is up because they can catch up to the talent of Stafford with better coaching and better talent around them. So you look at it and you say, it sucks for Stafford because everybody's saying it. You're wasting his prime years here, and uh, you got to step it up for this guy to have any monicum of success. We're waiting for playoff win number one in his guy's decade. That's a long ass time to wait, bro. We were in our twenties. I was getting married. The last, you know, I've had two kids. A lot has happened. We built a podcast network, and the Lions still haven't won a postseason game. So it's becoming stuff of legendary debate and discussion regarding the Lions' futility. It, it's it's unbelievable. But do you think any one of those three guys? You think those three guys are basically that next class yes, of quarterback? Yes, yes. those Goff, will be the guys that we'll be talking Garoppolo, about. Garoppolo, Trubisky. Yep, you got it. And then this next class of quarterbacks coming up. You're going to have a good dozen quarterbacks that are going to be, you know, mixing it up. And uh, it's nice to see. Yeah, it is. It, it really is. And look, like you said, those guys have decent spots where they're at. You know, Philadelphia's got some wide receivers. They got a little bit of a run game. They have a decent offensive line. They also have a, a tight end who has come to life uh, with, with, with uh, Zach Ertz. And, and you look at what's going on in Los Angeles. I mean, they've got Todd Gurley. Nuff said. You, you look at what's going on in San Francisco. Look, that team was putrid to start the year absolutely awful Carlos Hyde was the best thing they had going for him there was talks that Carlos Hyde wouldn't even be their starting running back you know and and now Jimmy Garoppolo comes in and it looks like a totally different offense so you're you're absolutely right all right we'll take our first time out we got to come back we got to diagnose and figure out what the hell's going on with the Pistons I mean we start talking nice about a team and they immediately go in the tank I mean they even sucked Adam in to start watching and man since he uh, gave him a stamp of approval Not so much good has happened with the organization. We'll talk about them next. You're listening to Doc and Jock on the Detroit Sports Podcast Network. Doc and Jock here for our host site, Podomatic.com. When Adam and I first started this project, we were looking for a great place to host all of our recorded audio. And thank goodness I Googled easy way to host podcasts. We came across Podomatic, and since then we've recorded seven to 800 weekly podcasts, and we're not stopping anytime soon. The reason why we've been able to have success, the reason why I'm staring at a beautiful DSP network banner on the wall is because we found a host site that generates quality links 
all of our supporters across the country and even overseas can find us. I mean, we record a podcast, boom, upload it within five minutes, and we can start advertising, telling everybody, hey, we got this great guest, we got these great discussions, and with that, we've been able to grow several podcasts on this network. Check out the network each and every week. Maybe new shows will be added in 2018. Great things happening because of the fact that we have a great host site. So if you're looking to start a brand new project, Doc and Jock, Vito, Jason, Steve, Jerry, all the hosts on the network, we're going to recommend one host site, Podomatic.com. Cause quick note, no hosts on the network will be suspended. Everybody is on the up and up. We all had our weekly meeting. We told everybody, look, don't you be harassing anybody. Be on the up and up. Look, all these people getting suspended every week. It's hit the NFL Network, NBC, ABC. Everybody's tripping out here. So look, dudes, if you're going to wild out and do your thing, just do it at 501. (laughs) Stop uh, pulling your wang out between the hours of 9 a.m. and 5. I know it's hard. I know with the advent of cell phones, you can check. It's it's, (laughs) it's hard not to uh, do those kind of things. And uh, the the funny part is when I read it, too. And I don't want to make light of it because obviously sexual harassment is terrible. But the stuff that I read is really off the wall ridiculous. Like, who in their right mind goes up to a woman's like, you got to do oral on me, baby, between the hours of 9 and 5? It's like... Sexual harassment's been around. This is not new. Most of these people are athletes, though. Well, not most of these people, but uh, uh, like w- I know. the NFL Network, these guys are athletes, right? But even if they I live was in a different world than I you know, and but I. if I was in power, I'm not going to be like, hey, baby, here's my way. I don't just whip know. It out. You probably would. <laughs> you probably it's, would. It's and look, the only person who ever is getting sexually harassed around here is me, anyways, and I don't care. It, Go ahead, pull your <laughs> wang out. So I'll it, laugh at it, too. So it's so, it's just, you have to laugh at it because it's so disgusting that every single day, I mean, now you got Larry King getting accused every single day. Yeah. Dude, it's starting to hit an epic crescendo now. Every time you turn around, it's like not just one story. It's like five stories. Oh, this person committed sexual harassment. It's absolutely nuts, man. Well, the good thing at DSP is we're sexual harassment free. We just like to clown around with our sports and make jokes. Because we're all dudes. We exactly. just sit around in a circle and show each other our dog. We all sit there and point and laugh. But it's it's unbelievable what's going on, and it's like almost daily. The one that kind of got me, too, was Mario Batali. Mario freaking Batali is a cook. Sit there in the kitchen and make good food. That's the easiest way to get into woman's pants cook for her bring that's out some it. wine that's it you just do that shit between i mean literally between the hours of 9 a.m and 5 p.m keep your wang in your pants and let's just roll with our roll with your business i mean Dude, come on sh- straight up right so i used to i worked in a restaurant like years ago and pretty much when you work in a restaurant like the entire staff is just down for just dtf <laughs> so they're all dtf right and it's it's because you sit there, you're you're they all everybody who works in a restaurant is generally addicted to something, right? Whether it be booze, drugs, generally your cooks are always high, uh your wait staff's <laughs> usually always drunk, and everybody wants to bang. Everybody. So you sit there, you cook all you you sit there, you serve all day, you cook all day, and, and then you, you you sit there afterwards, you usually have a beer or two, and then you know what? Everybody's DTF. Exactly. It feels like, you know, going with the approach of here's my wang and let's get down to business is not the way to go. If you no. want if you want to get down at work, you just be like, hey, babe, I got a joint, a couple of joints. Come on over. Let's watch some movies. Let's watch some Netflix and come hang out. That's all you got to do is ask maybe at lunchtime and things like that. And uh, don't use sex. Just ask a two woman to go on a date. Maybe just kind of, you know, wave the bag of, of joy. You know, wave the oxies, <laughs> wave the mollies and be like, look, you know, it's, 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 it's pill time. Dr. Feelgood is here to make all your problems go away. You know, everyone's everyone knows a doctor feel good. <laughs> doctor feel good. <laughs> so I don't understand what the approach is because I feel like uh, guys got guys. I guess in power got to figure out a new way to, to, look, to hit on women. Maybe these guys have never had to to sit there and, and try to struggle. I guess to to get ladies. I'm not really sure. I mean, and is it really a struggle? You just got to go up in there and talk to them. You don't even got to be a creep about it. Just go say, hey, what's up, girl? I, I don't know. I I don't know. I mean, there's cat calls, but not yeah. at work. Not at work. No, no, no. Definitely not at work. Right? You cat call and try to try to well, pick up I don't chicks. Know, maybe at work. When I was working at the restaurant, I used to call the one girl Miss New Booty. So, <laughs> see, because <laughs> she was just... brand new and she had a fat ass. So, <laughs> I would call her Miss New Booty whenever I seen her, and she liked it. So, it was what ups? It's just a new way now in thinking that in a, in a big corporate structure, you can't be doing that stuff. You got to save that for situations where you're trying to pick up somebody. It's just a really 
fucked up time that we're living in that each and every day i mean you're making like you're matt lauer and you're making 25 million dollars a year yeah dude you could do that at 501 you clock out you can just hire someone to stand there for a thousand dollars a day every day dude, you can have a new chick here you're getting a thousand dollars just stand there at 501 and walk me out to my car it. you don't want to be married fine just that's pay it. someone you could dude, find- you can call a high class escort service just like yeah. meet me at this hotel i'm mr j at 25 million if he paid a thousand dollars a day to a, a, a new person to escort him around for a day, he could have that's only three hundred yeah. grand a year. So you're, you're going to risk like a drop in a bucket. He's making twenty five million, not total, a year. Yeah, I mean, absolutely seriously, absolutely nuts. That would be the natural wang killer for me. Look, those checks keeping my wang in my pants, man. Yeah. I want those checks. But when you get in power and you can start doing things, you start putting you know alarms in your door. You know, it makes me really hard. Twenty five uh, million dollars, yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. God, makes me stand upright. Yeah, it's much better than talking about the Pistons because they're man, they're they atrocious. Ma- they're <laughs> atrocious. I cannot believe the. There performance. ain't nothing Just, softer than this defense. <laughs> I can't believe the performance they put out there on Tuesday. Stan Van Gundy said that you know against the Nuggets was probably one of the worst coaching performances he's ever had. Defense was poor, shooting was poor, leaving guys open. Nobody showed up to the building. Even the players, the starters, were outscored by the bench significantly. And so, since you got on board with the Pistons, they're mired in a losing streak yes. and they're playing absolutely atrocious. What's Am I going the on? Curse? What's going on with the Pistons? Look, man, it, you this can all boil down to a couple different things. You don't play defense, you don't rebound, and you don't move the ball. This team is going to struggle. On top of that, if Andre Drummond is not playing at, I don't even want to say an elite level, but at a very average level, a very good level, this team is going to struggle. Look, do you realize over the course of their seven game losing streak, Andre Drummond has scored more than 15 points only one time? And Reggie Jackson was asked, and he kind of let out some of the things they're seeing. Defenses have figured out what to do. You take away Andre Drummond, you make them shoot the outside shot, and in basketball, what's the hardest thing to do? The hardest thing is to shoot the basketball. And so when the shots don't fall, the other thing that you didn't mention was you got to make the shots because if you're going to take away Andre and you're going to press him and take away the inside, understandable. But if you're going to kick it out to Tobias when he's open, he's got to make it. He's you can't go it, yep. two for 11. Avery Bradley getting sick really puts a dent in the momentum. But what you see with the Pistons that's really disappointing is, fine, you don't execute, that's fine. You're going to have games like that. But to not bring the effort, to have your starters get embarrassed by— all defenses. Exactly. Your starters were embarrassed by your bench. The bench can't go in there. If you're going to talk about inserting Boban— you know, into the game more often and give him more minutes. You're talking about a team that's in trouble. Yep. And it's embarrassing, too, because you look at what's going on and you got to start asking, has the team tuned out Stan Van? Are they embarrassing him on purpose? Is this some kind of calculated effort, you know, in order to get him fired? Because I, I, I want you to say I want you to say what we were talking about before. When, when we were sitting there getting ready to do the show, uh, t- tell, tell everybody what you told me. Yeah, because when, I think it's important. Yeah, after a game, I think it was a Pistons blowout win. I think it was versus the Suns. They had blown them out. Or if it wasn't versus the Suns, it was against a team that they got a victory against. And Andre's sitting there smiling, and he's telling the reporters, like, look, we want to get, you know, they asked him, like, what's been going on with the offense? You guys are playing really well. And he comes out and says, look, we just wanted to get Stan Van off our ass. He's cussing at us all the time. We wanted to make him happy. He, he competes so well. And you feel like maybe Stan Van rubs these players the wrong way a lot of times with his cussing and the way he kind of openly discusses a lot of them. I mean, you've taken him to task several times saying, look, why do you got to come out and blast your players in this manner? And and at the same time, though, I love Stan Van Gundy. Yes. I think he's one of the best coaches we have in the area. I, I love the way he coaches. I, I think he's I think he has a great basketball mind. I think the players now, though, are so soft. That right there screams. It, it screams soft like their defense, man. It, it just... It drives me absolutely insane. Do you realize when, and look, there, there's no comparison to what I was doing when I was in fifth grade as a, what would it be, like 12, 10, I don't know, 11, whatever it was. As, as like a 10-year-old boy, what I was doing in basketball at, as a 10-year-old boy compared to what these grown-ass men playing for millions of dollars was doing. But I was getting cussed at by my drunk coach all the time. Right. But he was screaming at me, making me do ladders because, I don't know, I didn't lay the ball up right. Just look to Tuesday. That's soft, man. You are soft. Andre Drummond, he is supposed to be your star. He is soft. Just look to Tuesday. I mean, do you really think that the starters were offended that Stanley Johnson wasn't in the starting lineup? I mean, many people were pointing to say, look, if you let the players take the lead 
if you let them do a players only film session, you let them try to work it their way out of it. Why do you pull a guy that might be your best defender with an energy guy on defense? Yeah, he's struggling to put the ball in the basket, but why not let him work through it? I feel like some people maybe are looking at the Pistons and saying, "Look, you know, Dude, Stan you, Van, were, you have six games where you're not doing nothing." Stan Van, you know, took a guy out of the lineup that maybe shouldn't have been, and the players kind of responded to it. So I don't know, man. It's, I think it's a these, big problem. I think these players are soft. Look, Stan Van Gundy's got a very He's got a very coarse way of dealing with his players. And it was one of the things that I fell in love with at with him as a coach, especially when he was in Oakland or in Orlando when he was sitting there coaching with uh with Dwight uh, Howard. I, I love the way he handled Dwight Howard. I thought it was great. And because Dwight Howard uh, is a giant puss himself. He's super soft, right? Just like Andre Drummond. And and I love the way he sat there was able to to take care of things and look when when Dwight Howard threw him underneath the bus, went to management, and basically got him fired. I love the way Stan Van held his own and, and just took care of business. These players are atrocious. Like, if you're mentally, you can't handle your coach getting in your face, telling you what you're doing wrong, there's a bigger issue here. And Andre Drummond is probably the biggest issue on this team. When he is right and he is on, this team wins games. This team looks good. You're able to sit there and go out there and you're, you're able to compete with the likes of, of the Celtics. You're able to compete with the Warriors, uh, San Antonio. Stan Van Gundy obviously has to have a soft hand with him because he is too fragile of a player. His psyche is way too weak. And that, that drives me absolutely insane. Man up. Go do your job. You're getting paid millions to be a basketball player. You get to do stuff that kids want to do in, in, in playing a child's game. A millions. Like, you sit there and you get to go on Twitter and you get to hit on weird chicks from Disney and go on weird dates with them. When, when you're a grown-ass man, it's totally weird and kind of pervy, and you're allowed to do it because you're a damn basketball player making millions of dollars. It makes no sense to me why you can't handle your coach telling you what you're doing wrong. Look at the film. Watch. Get better. Want to get better. I just don't see the want out of these guys. You got to want to win. Defense is all effort. You don't have to be good to play defense. Honestly, you don't. Because you know why? I used to do it all the time. I'm not very good at basketball, but you know what I'd do? I'd go out there and I'd play real hard on defense. I'd hustle for loose balls. People were coming to the lane. Guess what? They were getting knocked down. I would sit there and be times where I'd be playing with three, four fouls, and it'd be the second quarter. I'm not going to last long, but you know what? You're going to come in. You're going to get a bucket. You're going to pay. That's what you got to do. Listen to this. So it was the Detroit Pistons versus the Golden State Warriors Friday night. The oh. missus was like, I want I want some buddies. I need a salad. I'm like, oh, okay, I'll take you. No problem. So we get to buddies, and I there, love I love it. You there's know why? no buddies. No. There's no Pistons on. I, I love it, dude, because you can tell that we're, we're from the same family. Because... <laughs> I want, I want salad. I want buddies. Yes, you do. Yes, yes you, do. you do. So I'm, I'm, I'm looking. Same at, cloth, I'm bro. like, oh, okay. So there's NFL Network on and NHL Network on. So of course, what do I do? I tweet buddies. I'm like, dude, this is where we're at right now. It's second quarter, and the, there's Why no. Just bu- ask the the waitress to put it. Up? No, I tweeted out and I made it a bit, and I said, look, should I even ask? You know, oh. does anybody not want to watch the Pistons? So right after I I push send, somebody put on the Pistons game, but it was midway through the second quarter, and uh, you know we've made it as a network where now all the companies that I tweet address it and are I like, oh, yeah. sorry, what's going on? That is enough. I have to. <laughs> yeah, so um, it was interesting that uh, I do believe that besides the, the geek nicks like you and I, the hardcore basketball fans, I don't think even people care. That if you told people, look, can you believe the Pistons are 25-1? and one? They'd be like, really? They, they, they wouldn't even they, they wouldn't they wouldn't even, know. They wouldn't know. But you had uh, Draymond Green after the Golden State Warriors defeated uh, the Pistons. Um, Kevin Durant just played uh, amazing. It was nice to see a superstar actually show up and play at LCA. But he kind of came out and uh, rubbed the salt in the wounds of uh, you know Pistons fans and Detroit Nation, saying, "Look, what's going on? The vibe in this building wasn't anywhere near what was going on at the Palace, and I love the Palace." He kind of brought up a topic that people are talking about regarding the vibe at LCA. He also did pay the the Pistons compliment as well as the organization. I think Steve Kerr said that uh, the Pistons are going to be a tough out in the playoffs and watch out, and they were the toughest team that they played you know on the road during that stretch of time. But uh, when you look at LCA, people are basically realizing, and uh, I, I, I'm shocked. A couple of people have said this to me. They've said, look, yes, it's nice, but for $800 million, for the price, when they look at that number, a lot of people have messaged and kind of said to me when we've talked about LCA, they've said, for $800 million, we've kind of seen this before. It's a nice building. It's new. It's nice. It's got all the plush things that nice buildings have. But for $800 million, does it really live up to that cost? Not really. And I, I kind of, when I thought about it and I said to myself for 800 million dollars 
I damn near want a freaking cup holder that kind of, you know, I push a button and it puts the cup in my hand or right. something different, something out of the ordinary technologically or something really unique that's different to other buildings. But a lot of people have messaged us and said, look, I've been to new buildings and it's just kind of the same architecture as other new buildings and we just pay top dollar for it. And I do believe that there's a little bit of backlash regarding the price. There's a backlash regarding the fact that both the wings and pistons aren't playing good. The vibe at LCA on some dead nights on a Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday are really quite embarrassing, and it's not getting better. And it's really become a, a talking point. And Draymond Green highlighted it saying the Palace is better. Yeah, and I can see that. I mean, look, you watch the game from home. You see all the red seats. They're everywhere. I mean, gold, the Golden State game, they were at 98% capacity. It was almost a sellout. Right. And still, Draymond's saying, look, it's just not loud. It's not loud enough. It's not like the Palace used to be. And the Palace, when they were winning, was an absolute pit. You know what I'm saying? It, it was, you wanted to be there. The place was raucous. It was nuts. But is it wrong when you look at it and say, for $800 million, it should be flawless? Like, we shouldn't have, like, if you look on the Facebook page, there's a lot of one-star yeah. reviews. That's pretty bad yeah, for a it, building that you should have thought, like, why did you spend this much money to build the upper bowl that the average Joe is going to hate. And the question that I think I asked Jason that kind of percolated based on some of the responses was this. For people that like nice things, that spend money, I can understand they're going to like it. Mm -hmm. Okay, but for the average Joe, for somebody that's just wants to go to a game a couple times a year, what is really there for them that would make the average Joe go, I want to go to LCA? You didn't build it for the common man. And exactly. I, say, I was going to say, I think that was the biggest flaw in this. It wasn't made for uh, a regular guy, a, a, a nine to fiver. And that's what Detroit is by and large. And get by. No, yeah. you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. And I think that was the biggest mistake with this. It's like yeah. you built an upscale restaurant, you built an upscale arena, and you got a, a Piston fan base and a Wing fan base that not that many people are going to be able to spend $200 a ticket. Right. You you built it for for the guy who wants to go have a, a fine wine and, and a big, thick, juicy steak with his wife. And instead, your clientele is a, a beer, burger, and brat kind of guy. It, you, you, you missed the boat on it a little bit. You know, not for the comment. So if I was going to ask you, I think, I think so. What could they have I, added I think, for the comment? Man? The I, I prices? think what you'll see, yeah, I think the, the the pricing could be could be a lot better. Um, but I think what you'll see is there there will be a correction because it would just be stupid business. And there's too many intelligent people working for for the Red Wings and, and working for the Illiches. They'll fix the prices as well as for the Pistons. I think they'll they'll fix some things. And there's going to be a little bit of a correction here where where it's just going to get it's going to get better. We we talk about the that, that that the seating that they have where you're allowed to go and it's like an open bar, open restaurant, and, and those those seats are all lined up across from the television cameras. So you see those empty spots all the time. Don't be surprised if after a certain time while the game's going on, that shuts down. So everybody has to be in their seats. Don't be surprised if something like that happens. Don't be surprised if there is some type of an adjustment, a correction. For the for the ticket pricing, so the average person can go, and, and whether or not you can only sit up in the upper bowl or or what it may be, you, it, there's going to be a correction. There has to be a correction because you can't. It's not good business to keep going on in this direction and doing things this way. Yeah, if we were build a, a building for the common folk, what else could you have included? I mean, obviously the price is coming down. What else? Maybe more like photo booths. I was thinking like more stuff to do. Like you can take pictures, you can do stuff, but maybe more, maybe like a video game station or something along those lines or an interactive situation where maybe there's a hologram or something. I don't know what what, what would a common person like in an arena that's not so hoity-toity. I, I think if you were to put in basically almost like a corner bar feel, but just kind of put like, like bars and restaurants, but kind of have that corner bar feel. Some place where you can kind of go in, grab your drink. If you want, you can leave, walk out right away. Or if you wanted to sit down, you could sit and, and, and just kind of relax for a minute. But it's not a place where you want to get too comfortable. You want it to be comfortable enough, but not too comfortable where you're going to put roots down. You want to be able to get in, get what you want to get, sit for maybe a minute, and then you want to get up and go to your seat. You want to drive the fan to their seat. And I don't think... The, the way the LCA is built right now, I think there's too much stuff going on on the outside. And what it does is it pulls the 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 attendance and it pulls the atmosphere away from the game and what's going on, and it kind of keeps it to the sides. And, and everybody's so worried about, I don't know, they got a recording studio in there, so let's go check out the recording studio. Or, hey, they got kind of like this little, uh, um, it's like a Red Wing Hall of Fame. Let's go check that out. They got a little Piston Hall of Fame. Let's go check that out. They've got this. They've got that. They've got so much going on. I think I think it's it, it would be better if it was addition by subtraction. Maybe take some things away. 
force the fan to go to their seat and sit and enjoy the game, enjoy the product. And look, it's not been a very good product lately, so I'm not sure what you're going to be enjoying there. But if you force the fans to their seat, I think then what happens is you lose that 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 effect or that feel that nobody's going to the games, nobody's showing up, nobody's watching everything. It's not loud. It's not a pit. It's it's just it feels like it's a spoiled fan base. You'd lose that if you're forcing them to be in their seats. Understood. Do you see a scenario in which the Pistons turn this around? Um, is this going to be a long-term turbulent season, or do they just need a quick victory to turn the tide again and get on a hot streak, win five or six? I don't think it's going to be uh, a turbulent season, but I think it's going to be a little up and down. This is what I was worried about. I was worried about these long stretches where they start losing games and they can't pull out of them quickly. I, I think the big issue here, and I'm sure Stan knows it too, you got to figure out a way to get Andre free. The, the whole offense runs through Andre Drummond. You know, it's a, it's a lot of pick and roll. It's a lot of here. We're going to give you the ball at the top of the key, and you're going to pass it down low. You sit there. You roll off your man. You get open. You know, you go crash the boards. You either put the bucket back in or or you sit there and, and, and you get the pass and, and you lay it up. If Andre is hitting from the field, if he's hitting better than 50%, you got a great shot to win these games. He's just got to get the ball more. Stan's going to have to figure out a way to to devise a plan and come up with an offense that's going to allow him to get freed up. I think they're going to end up being up and down most of the season because I think they're going to have a couple more of these stretches where they lose a few games and they have some clunkers. But I think they'll pull out of it. This team, I, I think, when they were on the roll and they were really, really hot and, and they were first, second, third, maybe even fourth in, in, in the entire Eastern Conference, I, I think this team was I, it was a little bit of fool's gold. You know what I'm saying? They'll turn it around. I think this team will get going in the right direction. It's just going to be – you're probably looking at a team that will finish – Either fifth or sixth, maybe seventh in the East. I think first and first and the first and a second, third, fourth seed was 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 fool's gold. We wanted it too much, and it's just it, the team's not talented enough. I'll say this again. I still think you should watch the Pistons. I do think they are better, but to have a losing streak like this, it does happen during the season. Um, Reggie Jackson did say that some teams have figured out some things to do defensively to thwart the Pistons' efforts on offense. But at the same time, then you, you got to adjust. you got to be able to step back, readjust, and uh, do things that will help your team win. I do think this is a playoff team. I do think they will be a tough out. But again, when these type of performances happen, all it does is ignite those that say tank, get that superstar, give people a reason to put their asses in the seats. And once you have that superstar, all the other stuff will be ancillary regarding the prices, the bars, the common man stuff that we're talking about. If you put a superstar like a KD in there that can sell big-time shoes and that's got some swagger, you get, you're going to have a, a draw, an attraction. There's nobody on the Pistons, basically, that I'd pay to go see. If it wasn't for free, I'm sitting at home. That's basically where you're at with the Pistons. If it's not a free ticket, if it's not a media credential, there's no real reason to go down there. Tobias Harris, Avery Bradley, they're fine players above average. Are they superstars? I don't think they'll turn into it, but they're going to want superstar dollars. And so you've paid Andre Drummond superstar dollars, but at the same time, he can be taken away and he can be minimized, which is a big problem when you're paying a man over $20 million. So stick with the Pistons. Watch them. But I think you're watching for a different reason. Don't look so much at wins and losses. Just kind of look at the progression of some of these guys that might be here for the foreseeable future. Stay with us. We'll come back. A round of jock jams has to occur. Some news and notes happening around the world of Detroit sports. I definitely have to get the jock's opinion. I think he's sitting there ready to deliver. You're listening to Doc and Jock, Detroit Sports Podcast Network. Thanks, everybody, for your continued support. Free and easy way to support this project. We've been going strong since 2013. We're well over 200 episodes deep on this podcast. Several podcasts have recorded 100 episodes. We couldn't be able to grow this network, earn credentials, and develop a strong relationship with our supporters and listeners without your fine support. Free and easy way to support us? Go check out our website, DetroitSportsPodcast.com. Free and easy way to help us keep going day by day, week by week, helps us to keep the lights on in the studio. And I peek around each and every week. New podcast networks are popping up. New sports networks are popping up. And I greatly appreciate those that have reached out and uh, asked for shout outs or asked for um, advice on how to podcast and how to grow um, your support base via the social media platform. It's greatly appreciated. Follow us on Twitter at Detroit Podcast. You can follow Adam at Adam R-S-T-R-O-Z and continue to support us by visiting our website, DetroitSportsPodcast.com. Pro 
we got the best bumper music in all the land. It's great, man. Week in, week out. Don't want to change it too much because, right, people say, why do you guys use the same wrestling music? Because it hypes us up, gets the thoughts flowing, it makes us feel good, you know, to support those that we enjoy in the professional wrestling world. And it's also fun to kind of weave in a little bit of wrestling into our sports take. A lot of people liked my Woken take regarding the Pistons and kind of weaving it in there. People were like, dude, you're a wrestling fan, aren't you? Some people messaged me. I'm like, of course I'm a wrestling fan. I've been watching it since I was eight. And to kind of weave it in there, really got some good hits. I was really impressed with my creativeness in the last seven days. All I have to do with the scarf and spending money on myself. <laughs> And, such a nut. and props to Vito winning the Universal Little Person Association. Yeah, what was that? What is that? Okay, I'll let the do cat we out of do, did you did you do this? That was a bit. <laughs> okay, so he, he he walked in. He was listening to the radio on the way in, and he's like, he's like, guess what? I won an award, and I'm like, really? What? He's like, I'm the sexiest little person in America, and I'm like, what? I'm like, so do do it? Because obviously, when we, when we Vito joke, we do bits and we have a good time, and that kid's fun. And that's what makes his project He's got a fun. great personality. He's, he's like, you know, willing to do anything I say. So I'm like, okay. So <laughs> He's like your puppet, huh? <laughs> no, he, he adds, he's the he's the guy with the ideas, and then I kind of shape it into the bit part. And then oh, okay. he liked it. He's like, that was funny because I put not sure if uh, this is real or not, thanks. And I created a certificate. I did all that. And uh, he, he he rolls with it. That's, that's what you like about a kid like that is that he knows he's a little person, but he owns it. And he's a boss, and uh, he does everything very well. He's lining up big guests. I mean, literally, one of the first dudes that just came on and said, I want to be on your network. And he invited himself, and he's been a mainstay. He's almost at 200 podcasts recorded himself, and he's got great guests. He's, people want to talk to him. He's a mainstay figure in high school sports. He's got a lot of relationships. A good kid, and uh, he broke news. He was one of the first people to report that Bakari Alexander was back. He beat uh, the news in the free press by like 10 minutes. So he tweeted out there first. So he's an individual that's doing some things, and uh, he's fun to have around, no doubt about it. Dude, would, you, would you ever have expected the first time we met Vito that, that he'd be here now? <laughs> no. Never in a million years. No, the dude's coming up with ideas. Uh, I, lo- I love yeah. Vito, too. I love him. I think he's can't great. not like Vito. The, the, the first time we met him, dude, we, we went to his radio. Yeah. We went to, I, we he were invited guest, us. We, yeah, we were a guest on his radio show when he was doing stuff at, uh, at Detroit U of Mercy. D. Yep. And I think when we both left, we're like, man, that dude loves to talk. <laughs> that was what we said. Because he would, he would only, he'd, like, you would have a show with him, and it'd be like an hour and a half long, and Vito would talk for like an hour and 15 <laughs> yeah. minutes. <laughs> exactly. All right, this is Jock Jams. We've got a lot of questions regarding the news and notes around the, the world of Detroit sports and what we call Jock Jams. All right, here, cuz, I'm throwing you a curveball because this just broke. Um, I don't know if you heard the news. Um, Jack Morris and Alan Trammell were inducted via this committee into the Hall of Fame. But obviously, when you earn an accolade, some of the shit that you've done in the past comes up. So basically, back in the day, 1990, he said some pretty nasty things sexually to a college intern. And uh, he Jack basically, Morris. Jack Morris, basically, he said to uh, a writer intern, I think from the Free Press, he said, look, I'm not talking to any woman while I'm naked unless she's on top of me. <laughs> so it got That's discussed. That's a great line, but you're an asshole. Yeah, it got discussed. And now it's being brought up again. The, the Free Press brought it up. And uh, the way they wrote it was, in 1990, Jack Morris made disgusting comments to then Free Press intern Jennifer Frey. And now they're calling for a review of his Hall of Fame induction. Ooh. Based on his past indiscretions, kind of being that gruff athlete mm-hmm. making some disgusting comments to an intern. And basically, the, when it was addressed... Um, Bo Schembechler, who was working with the Tigers at the time, said, that's her fault. That's the free press's fault for sending an intern into that environment, into a locker room with naked dudes. Should, of, of Jack, should Jack Morris's Hall of Fame induction be looked at and maybe revoked based on this old stuff being rehashed? Look, I, I don't know, okay? Because I think a lot of what... I, I Look, Jack Morris is an asshole, all right? No, let's just call it for what it is, all right? And Bo Schembechler, for his stance on it, he's an asshole too, all right? But that being said... Your Hall of Fame induction should be based upon what you do on either the field, on the ice, or on the court. It really shouldn't have a bearing on, I guess, either your your personality type or what you did off the field or off the ice or off the court. It, It should be based purely on what you meant to your team, what your performance said you were, and how you relate to everybody else in your era. Now, like the whole comparing the eras get, gets a little bit weird, and it's like, look, the, the athletes now are totally different than the athletes then, so you can't compare them. So it should be based upon what you do, what you mean to your team, and, and and how you perform at that time 
in your in your era with your peers. Exactly. And I always feel like we have to preface it. You're not advocating for what he did. You don't have no. to be a Hall of Fame no. person to get into the Hall of Fame. It's based upon your performance as an employee, as a worker, as somebody that played baseball. It, based on this, yeah, obviously he's an asshole. It wasn't handled correctly. It was botched. And uh, this stuff lives forever. Um, this stuff was written about, and I guess it's just being rehashed. This is not oh, This is not new news. It's just being rehashed. And uh, it's very fascinating to look at what you do you're held accountable for. What do you think the recent commitment of former Ole Miss quarterback Shea Patterson to the Wolverines means to the program? Because it's a very fascinating dynamic because even among Michigan fans, people are like, why don't you develop your own quarterback? Why are you going out there and pinching players from a program like an Ole Miss who you sat there and said uh, you called them one of the poster children for tainted programs? And so don't you think maybe there's a risk that Shea Patterson, maybe, maybe not a big risk, but maybe him and his colleagues maybe took some of those funky handshakes to go to Old Miss, and now that that um, has ended, they've jumped now to Michigan. So it's a debatable point, one that Michigan fans are looking at and saying, is this what we want to do to compete in the big-time world of college football? Do we want to go out there and pinch players? What say you? Now, I'm, I'm not sure, and I have no inside information. Maybe he did, maybe he didn't take any of those backwards handshakes. If he did, he did. That's... What he did with Old Miss. Oh, if they go to Michigan, that's well, no, no problem. What, what I'm saying is as long as Michigan's not involved in any of it now, you're fine. All that being said, at some point, Jim Harbaugh and this uh, these coaches have to start to develop their own players. I mean, do you remember what it was like last year when, when Brian Lewerke was going through his struggles? At some point, your quarterback has to go through his struggles. There's got to be a little bit of a learning curve. And if you're expecting a national championship next year, who are you expecting this with? Are you expecting this with the the guy you just brought in from Old Miss who might not even play? Because there's no guarantee that he's going to play for for Michigan starting next year. You know, he's got to go through all kinds of BS with the NCAA still. On top of all of that, you have a quarterback here who the team seemed to respond to and seemed to get behind and he was able to go out there and win you a couple games and when he was in the game, he looked pretty good. Looked like he had a pretty good understanding of the offense and was able to get things done. So now you're going to sit there, turn around, and tell him that, hey, you're competing for the job again. The The guy who was ahead of you just left, and when you weren't competing and you weren't on the uh, on the field, the team was totally in the dumpster and, and in a downward spiral. It, it just doesn't make sense. I don't know what kind of message you send to your players and to your kids. It, it just it, it blows my mind. Now, look, Shea Patterson is a very good quarterback. Coming out of Florida, he was the number one ranked quarterback uh, back in was I believe it was 2016. He was the number one ranked pro style quarterback coming out in 2016, and nationally he was the fourth ranked quarterback. So that's all fine and good, and that's all recruiting information right there. It, what matters is what he can do on the field. Can he grasp this offense? Can he understand this? Can he come in and can he get it all figured out and, and hit the ground running? I'm not sure. It's going to take some time. We're going to have to see. I, I, I want to see. Jim Harbaugh, though, develop his own quarterback. I want, I, I, I don't necessarily want the growing pains, but generally you have to go through the growing pains so the guy can come in and help your team win. I want to win a national championship. I told you at the beginning of last year, I expect a national championship this upcoming year, and I don't know if I'm going to get it now, you know, and, and I don't know how much time I've got to keep giving this coach and, and giving this program. You know, you, you come in with a huge resume. You do a lot of really good things in the National Football League. You did a lot of really nice things over in Stanford. And, and now the questions are starting to arise. Did you make Andrew Luck or did Andrew Luck make you? And look, Andrew Luck hasn't had the best pro career. He hasn't. He came in. There was a lot of gusto. He looked pretty good when he was healthy. The guy's been injured every time you turn around. And even when he's not injured, he looks shaky to say the best, Okay. I'm not really sure what I have here as far as a head coach in Jim Harbaugh. I'm not really sure what I have here as far as his staff goes. I don't even know what I have as far as as a starting quarterback. And we discussed this before. There are a couple ways to win in college. You can either have a really good defense. If you have a really good defense that's elite, you then usually need a really good running back or an elite running back, or you need a really good quarterback or an elite quarterback. It's some kind of combo of one of those two or one of those three. You know, you, you need something else. And I don't know what we have as far as a quarterback. I, I think Brandon Peters did a pretty good job when he started this past year. I don't know what Shea Patterson is going to bring in here. I have no idea what he's going to do. I have no no clue. I mean, let's not forget, right? There, there There's what? Joe Mixon, who's who's another guy who says, don't count me out. I've seen his little Twitter and Instagram post. And, and then, then you've got uh, um, uh, McCaffrey as well. 
So, I mean, you've got guys, and you've got guys who look like they come from a stable uh, of good athletics and, 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 and good DNA, but who's going to win the job? And look, I think competition is great, but at some point, you got to name your guy, and you got to ride with him. And you can't just ride with him for one year and then say, okay, cool, we're going to do it all over again. No, you got to ride with him for some consistency. That's what's missing with this program. You've had interchangeable pieces at quarterback for the last couple of years, and you don't know who your quarterback is going into next year. So what are we doing here? Switching to the Red Wings, man, they're mired in a losing streak as well, not playing the best. Uh, Jeff Blaschel's trying his absolute best to get the most energy out of these guys, trying to figure out what is best for the Red Wings. But a lot of people are looking at it and saying, Based on this roster, they're stuck right there in the middle. I mean, you got some youth, you got some talent, you got some aged veterans, but I think people now are resigned to the fact that they, they're saying, I'm not watching the Red Wings until Holland and Blaschel are fired. Um, when you look on the ice, you're looking at the progression of some of these younger talent, but at the same time, we have to ask the question, who is the core group of the Red Wings that has to take this team to the next level? Because it's not Zetterberg, it's not Cronwall anymore. I mean, I think uh, Zetterberg got a goal, uh, the first goal in 23 games the yeah. other night. So he's struggling mightily. He's collecting a big check. He's a locker room glue guy. But at the same time, I don't think at this point in time, if he were to be traded, I don't think many people would be that upset really at all or even care. But for you, who do you think has to take this team by the reins in order to get to the next level? Who's got to be the core? Who's got to get the ice time for this Red Wing team to get off the schneid and, and do some things, get some points? Because they're at an under a point a game pace right now, and you can't do that. you got to be at well over a point a game pace to get to the postseason. I mean, you got to get 95 to 100 points to get into the postseason. So when you're at 30 games and less than 30 points, you're fucking up. Yeah, uh, of course, Dylan Larkin, Anthony Mantha, and, and Andre Athanasiu. Th those are all names that are top of mind. These are, the, these are the three guys who you have to lean on right now to carry this team. And all that being said, none of these guys are special. Like, none of these are... Superstar special. Yeah, none of these are Connor McDavid. Uh, none of these are, 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 are Jack Eichel. None of these guys are, are anything other than good players. Austin Matthews over there, sexy right. Toronto. Exactly. None of these guys are, are at that level. So you're going to have, if the wings are, are able I'm not to, texting you, hey, bro, let's go down and see Athens to see you. No, you're not. <laughs> you're not. Like, if the wings are, ha are, are lucky enough to stumble upon something who, or, or somebody who, who's going to be uh, a transcendent player, that'll be great. But right now, you're going to have to lean heavily on Larkin, who looks to have taken a, a little bit of a step forward. I still want to see him do more with the puck, and I want to see him stay off the outside of the boards. I want to see him drive to the middle and do do some of the dirty work in front of the net. I want to tell you something, though. Is it bad to say, bro, let's go down and see Witkowski kick some people's ass? That was nice to see no, him go down no, there. It's, it was, that's, it not was, <laughs> that's not bad. That's not bad. He is he's fun a, to watch. <laughs> dude, it's like a 10-game suspension. Don't you want to kind of wait a game before you throw down again? No. Hell no. He's like, fuck that. I'm going to throw down. And uh, people were like, dude, he's having two or three fights with the same dude. We haven't seen that in a while yeah. at uh, LCA. So that's the. No, I I like watching it's him. bad to kind of <laughs> talk about it that way. But the only thing we can talk about is fucking fighting at the LCA. That's, that's about it. That's what it is, man. That's what it is. And look, I like what Anthony Mantha brings. He brings a little bit of an edge. He's uh, He's got a little bit of that sandpaper skin where he's a little, a little bit of grit. And he can score. He can finish. And he's got good vision. You know, it just he's got to keep skating. And Andre Athens to see you, I like what I'm seeing out of him. These All these guys need to be your ice time leaders. I mean, you, you talked about it with Henrik Zetterberg. Scored his first goal in 23 games. You, re, you do realize Henrik <laughs> Zetterberg leads this team in ice time? Oh. And look, yeah, cool. He's your captain. He should be your leader, but he doesn't necessarily have to be your leader in your ice time, you know? Larkin should be out there 19 to 20 minutes a game. Mantha needs to be out there anywhere from 18 to 20 minutes a game. And same thing with Athens to see you. All these guys need to be out there more because they're the only guys on this team right now who can score. So put them out there and, and, and let them create and let them generate points for you because you can't score goals. Those are your three guys that you need going forward to be maximizing their ice time. And if you're lucky enough to stumble upon somebody who is a transcendent player, who is a superstar or has the potential to become a superstar, get them in here as soon as possible and let them get some ice time. Stop with all this BS where, all right, well, Hank's our captain, so Hank's got to play 20. No, Hank does not have to play 20. I Look, Steve Eisman, there was a point there where Steve Eisman could do nothing but go out there and take faceoffs. That was all he could do. He had one knee. He could sit there and he'd have to be helped over the boards and he'd have to be helped back into the bench. And all he could do is he could skate out there, win you a draw, you possess the puck enough time so he can get off the ice, and then you move it. 
That, that was all he was there for. That was all he could do. Sometimes that's all your captain can do, and that's all you need your captain to do. You know, lead by example sometimes. You don't need to sit there and carry the ice time. Okay, final thing regarding the Detroit Tigers. Lots of talk regarding potentially trading Ian Kinsler. How are we going to reshape the lineup? People being signed. Not so many big-time signings. I mean, they signed fires from the Houston Astros, gave him a contract. It's okay, but he had similar numbers to Sanchez. He's probably going to be a so-so pitcher, eat up some innings. But in terms of the money that he's making, it's fascinating to see that a guy with an under 500 record can earn seven, eight million dollars a year as it's a nuts, pitcher. Huh? That is crazy. But I, the big I feel like that's uh, that signing right there is just like um. Uh, what's his nuts that they let go to to Minnesota last year? Um, Pelfrey? Yes, just like Pelfrey. Just like Pelfrey, just like Sanchez. Now, the big talk, though, it's heating up with the Yankees loading up there and picking up Stanton. They may be peeking into some phone calls and some inquiries regarding Michael Fulmer. Do you think Michael Fulmer will be traded to the Yankees? And if so, does Alavila have to get a huge return? And do you think that he can command that? Because he's talking the talk. He's saying, we will not let go of Michael Fulmer unless we get back top prospects. But do the Yankees even have a chance to give that back with some of the moves that they made? I mean, they basically stole Stan in a move that really probably should be investigated based on what was given up. I mean, they basically gave up nothing to get one of the premier hitters, a guy with over 50 home runs, and you're going to feature that. And then you add Michael Fulmer? Do that. That might be a team where you got to watch every game if they come to the Comerica, if they pick up Michael Fulmer as well. Holy shit. Um, I'm all about the trade. And this is a total change of pace for me from where we were last year when baseball season was going on. I was totally opposed to trading Michael Fulmer. But at this point, looking at what they've got and, and kind of where they're going and the trajectory that they're looking to be at, yeah, I'm all about it. Trade Michael Fulmer. Look, New York has a couple prospects that you can go out and you could legitimately request and ask for. Uh, uh, Chance Adams, he's a right-handed pitcher. You could go out and get him on Major League Baseball's top 100. I believe he's in the top 50. Um, they have another pitcher, uh, uh, Juices uh, Sheffield. Another, he's a left-handed pitcher. You can go out there and get I think he's in the top 100. He's like, I think, 80 or something like that. They have prospects that you could go out there and you could demand. If you could turn around and you could flip Michael Fulmer, because, look, you're not going to win for the next two or three years. If you could flip Michael Fulmer and you can bring in two top 100 prospects that could help fill out your pitching rotation down the line, I'm all about it. That's a two-for-one deal. And you're not ready to win now, so it only makes sense to be able to go out and do it. And if there's a, if there's a prospect out there, a, a positional player, you can get a positional player and a pitcher, I say go ahead and do that too because you're going to need guys. I mean, I don't think we need any more infielders a- after what happened last season it, it was like that was all they were getting back were, were were middle infielders. So I don't think you need that. But if you can go out there and you get a positional player and a starting pitcher, I'm cool with it. The whole the the way Dave Dombrowski used to to, to sit there and draft and the guys he would get back, it was always a, a hard throwing starting pitcher. So you can never have enough of those guys because in the end you can always turn around and flip them for somebody else. Great podcast, sir. Can't wait for baseball season. Um, can't wait to see how the Lions progress. Can't wait to see how the Red Wings and Pistons try to come up from some struggle. So uh, I kind of wrote on Twitter, on our Twitter page, at Detroit Podcast, it does kind of feel like Detroit sports needs a, a big, massive enema to kind of flush out all the garbage and restart in 2018. Because if you looked at and listened to a lot of the podcasts that we did this year, a lot of it was very critical. We're always negative. But at the same time, it is warranted because of the fact that a lot of these teams are kind of treading water and they're not moving in the right direction. So what we provide is we provide that little bit of boost to maybe push them in the right direction because otherwise they'll just be middling around uh, 500 or middling around entering the postseason. None of them really are on a trajectory for a championship. The only team, the only program that's on a trajectory to a championship is the Michigan State basketball program, and it'll be fun to watch to see how they progress throughout this season. But everybody else, a lot of question marks, a lot of things to be critical about, but a lot of things to be thankful about too, in that we can all go down and enjoy these games. We can watch a lot of different sporting events. You can get into a lot of different things. So we are thankful for Detroit sports, but we're ready for some new waves, some new talent. And uh, if you want to check out my last funny post regarding who got sentenced to deletion, it was very funny. And I think it's true. If all these guys that I put on the list got let go or moved on, I feel like It's time. I think people are ready for a new wave, a new crop of people, because we've been talking about and complaining about the same 10 guys for the better part of 24 months, and it's time. It's it's time for someone to step up and do some things. But uh, maybe a quick bit here at the end of the podcast. Who is really sentenced to deletion this week? Reggie Jackson. Dude sulks. I don't like to see a guy at the end of a game putting a towel on his head. Dude is an individual that... 
despite his best efforts, not a leader. I don't think that a guy like him needs to be on the Pistons. I wish Stan Van could find a trade partner to get rid of him. So who does Doc sentence to deletion this week? Reggie Jackson. See everybody next week. I look forward to, you know, wrapping with you and uh, continuing having a lot of fun talking Detroit sports. Go Pistons. This was locker room talk. Second dick. Sorry, Detroit. <laughs> Didn't quite work out. And I, all I can say is Detroit sports podcast scores. I have voices in my head. They counsel me. They understand. They talk to me. Show me.